Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee will come to order. It is March 13th, 2023, 1230, room 1150 of the Senate Building, and a quorum is present. Hope everybody had a great weekend. We have a, a full agenda today. We're going to start by hearing Senator Zhang's bill, Senate File 1787. Senator Zhang. Welcome back, Senator Zhang, to your bill. Uh, hello, chairs and uh, committee members. I do have a D. I do, I do have a A1 amendment, Senator Zhang. Or uh, let me see here. There's a couple. Yeah, the A1 amendment. It's uh, simply an update to last year's bill, uh, and it updates the numbers. Senator Zhang offers the A1 amendment. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A1 amendment, say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The A1 is adopted. Senator Zhang, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Chair and members. This is a bill uh, continuing the work from last year to upgrade uh, electrical panels and the houses or uh, you know, so should we say the homes of individuals? Uh, it is an issue that is particularly important as homes throughout Minnesota are aging, homes that are at their absolute maximum capacity for electrical use. Uh, Senate file 1787. Um, we have a policy in this state to transition to uh, electric vehicles, and for many homes, there's absolutely no way on the existing panels that most of our homes have, uh, they would be able to do that, uh, let alone getting something like an electric stove to replace their gas stove or switching their gas furnace uh, to an electric furnace. So what this would really do is uh, make sure that we are, um, it, it creates a grant program to make sure that folks who are low to low income to moderate income would be able to upgrade their electric panels. Specifically, this bill provides grants to get residential uh, electric panels up to date, uh, and it will cap at 150% of the area median income. Um, and in areas such as St. Paul, you know, it would be about uh, uh, 80, a little over $89,000 uh, for a family of four. Uh, so we are we are not talking about uh, high income high income individuals here. Uh, this makes sure that as we upgrade the uh, electrical integrity grid, we are preserving the existing housing stock. It creates safer homes by replacing out of date fuse boxes with modern circuit breakers. Uh, it will support good jobs in the electrical field, as we have one amongst us here. And uh, it also expands consumer choice by making homes more ready for the innovative electric technologies that are currently being marketed to individuals. Um, I have several testifiers here, and I would like to invite them to testify before the committee. Thank you, Senator Zhang. I have uh, Mr. Snope and Mr. Robertson. And the first two, if you could both come forward. Mr. Snope, nice to see you again. Uh, if you could please identify yourself and present to the committee. We're looking at uh, two or three minutes, if that's enough time to share. I think I can do it quicker than that. <laughs> I'll try. Um, thank you, Chair Friends. My name is Andy Snope. I am the Legislative Director for IBW Local 292. We represent 5,000 electrical workers who work throughout the state of Minnesota. Our members and the contractors our members work for perform this work. Much of the work of electrical upgrades in residential dwellings are performed by small electrical contractors, one or two person shops. While we move towards renewable energy production and towards electrification, this bill is a piece of that puzzle to provide homes with the needed added electrical capacity to become electrification ready. In conjunction with the electrical infrastructure upgrades to the distribution system, Electric panel upgrades will help to provide homeowners with increased capacity and circuit expansion space to add solar 
uh, production, energy storage, electric vehicle charging, air source HVAC and water heating systems, and added electrical appliances within their home. This bill addresses the greatest need first, typically in areas of underserved communities. In my years in the industry as an electrician, I saw the greatest need for this work in the areas of the metro and rural parts of the state where the largest economic disparities exist. Most typically in single and multifamily rental units where most likely landlords are not going to make that investment or homeowners don't have the economic means to make those investments in their home energy and efficiency needs. This bill, this bill helps to overcome those economic barriers. The IBW has been working with other stakeholders on this proposed proposal for quite some time. Not only does this bill provide the incentive for homeowners to upgrade electrical panels, but it also helps to provide an economic stimulus and jobs component by providing grants to electrical contractors and the electricians who perform this work. Again, mostly small businesses. The language within this bill reiterates that the state requirements that this work is performed by a licensed electrical contractor and electricians, and language within this bill also requires that the workers employed by the electrical contractors are paid area standard wages and benefits. These requirements help to assure the homeowner and property owner that they will receive the highest quality installation using the highest quality, best trained individuals to perform the work. Thank you, Senator Shang, for your work with the stakeholders to author this bill and bring it forward. And thank you, uh, committee members. Please support Senate File 1787. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Snope. Uh, Mr. Robertson. Thank you, Chair Franz. Thank you, Senator Zhang, for authoring this bill. My name is Mike Roberts, and I'm the Brush with Kindness Program Manager at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity. And my work is specifically with low-income homeowners that Mr. Snope was talking about, living in single-family residences. Our mission is to bring people together to create, preserve, and promote affordable homeownership and to advance racial equity in housing. My repair program works specifically with clients making 30% of the area median income or less. These are homeowners, so extremely low income. And in almost every case, the home they are living in is not only their largest asset, uh, but it's their more most affordable housing option. As our work at Twin Cities Habitat and other developers evolves to include electrification and decarbonization, the bill under consideration is the right kind of resource at the right time to help us and other housing organizations leverage the value of solid existing housing stock and to pave the way for electrical improvements that not only benefit the environment, but also address major health and safety issues for the homeowner. A brief story. I worked with a, a homeowner named Patricia in North Minneapolis. She's an African American who's lived in Minneapolis in the north side for over 30 years. Her home is immaculate inside and out, but she contacted us because as an older adult, she was having some mobility issues and wanted us to look at uh, uh, putting in some handrails and grab bars, but she was also, quote, blowing fuses. So when I assessed the property, the electrical panel was in fact a box with four fuses in it for running the whole house. Now considering that the current electrical code requires at least that many circuits just for a kitchen, it was clear that the circuits were simply o overloaded and unsafe. A typical panel upgrade to a 200 amp service has cost in the past between two and $3,000. But in this case, because it was such an old service, we had to upgrade the meter socket and the mast, which pushed our costs over $5,000. Now, of course, this was before the pandemic. And so as you all know, uh, costs for labor and for materials have, have risen substantially to closer, I estimate something around $10,000 at this point. The bottom line, though, is that Pat's house is much safer, and by removing the barrier of pre-electrification, she can now more easily take advantage of clean, highly efficient green technologies, such as rooftop solar and air source heat pumps for he heating, cooling, and water heating. These improvements will be good for Pat's monthly expenses, for the indoor air quality of her home, and of course, good for the environment. Grants like the one proposed in this bill supplement the available Inflation Reduction Act funding, the federal funding that's coming. They support the move towards a decarbonized economy. They support affordable neighborhood housing stock. They support local licensed trade contractors and housing organizations. And most importantly, they support the health, safety, and stability of homeowners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Robertson. Ne uh, next, we have Mr. Bull and Mr. Fowler. If you find gentlemen are ready to come forward.
Mr. Bull, welcome back to the committee. If you could please identify yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Mike Bull, uh, here on behalf of Minnesota Power, and we appreciate the opportunity to testify in favor of Senator Zhang's Senate file 1787 and thank Representative Zhang for bringing it forward. For our customers that wish to increase the efficient use, their efficient use of electricity, a home's electric panel can be a surprising roadblock to doing so. As a general rule, the focus of these customers is on the electric appliance they wish to purchase, the air source heat pump, the electric induction stove, heat pump water heater, or on the vehicle, the electric vehicle or plug-in hybrid, but these customers can run into difficulty when they realize their home doesn't have enough electrical capacity to support these electric appliances and charging equipment. Uh, as others have uh, shared their testimony, upgrading that electric panel uh, can cost thousands of dollars, and this is the barrier that Senator Zhang is working to reduce through this panel upgrade grant program. We support a reliable, affordable, equitable energy, clean energy transition, and this bill targets support to removing a barrier to for whom this additional cost would be most difficult to bear. We urge your support for the bill and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Mr. Fowler. Thank you, Chair Frentz uh, and members of the committee. My name is Eric Fowler. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a senior policy associate on Fresh Energy's buildings team. Uh, Fresh Energy is a nonpartisan Minnesota-based clean energy policy nonprofit dedicated to advancing the clean energy economy. And I'm grateful to testify in favor of SF-1787, which will provide grants to upgrade residential electric panels in low and middle income homes, as we've heard both single family and multifamily. Um, as as we've, we've heard uh, uh, also emphasized by other testifiers, adequate electrical capacity um, we see as a major barrier to residential electrification and electric vehicle expansion. Um, and it is often hidden. Uh, residents may not realize they need the upgrade until they're also getting bids on a heat pump or EV charger. So whether residents uh, pursue electrification for home comfort reasons, uh, indoor air quality, climate pollution reduction, or energy independence, we know that our homes will continue to electrify. This program helps level the playing field with panel upgrade grants for low and moderate income Minnesotans so that that next generation of technologies and vehicles are available to all, not just to the wealthy few. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I will also be available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Um, before we go to member questions, any members of the public who wanted to testify that didn't get on the list, seeing no hands, uh, members, any questions? I see Senator Rarick and Senator Weber. The intention is to lay this bill over. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> I don't know if the question is for the author or, or for those working on the bill, but uh, my question is, with the grant amounts being uh, 6000 and, and then uh, 4000 um, how is it that you came about with those two numbers? Senator Zhang. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair and uh, Senator Rurick. Uh, I think it was work that we were working off from last year uh, based on the total grant amount that we wanted. Uh, mind you, we wanted the cap was 150 percent uh, of the median air income, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. the specifics mm -hmm. of the 6,000. Do you want to comment on that, Mr. Fowler? Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you, Fire to the chair. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, uh, as as we heard before um, from the uh, testifier from Habitat for Humanity, we've seen a lot of these costs go um, continue to go up. Um, and one of the interests here in the program design is uh, is avoiding a situation where someone has to front uh, money and then wait for reimbursement or where they're only able to benefit from the program um, if they can cover, for example, a remaining 50%. Um, and so this uh, is designed to work uh, in conjunction with the rebates coming through the Inflation Reduction Act, so that $6,000. Um, when added to an electrification rebate from the Inflation Reduction Act, 
um, uh, which is $4,000 uh, under the HERA program. Um, so, so six plus four gets us to 10,000, which was the grant amount proposed in this bill last year for a single family homeowner. Thanks, Mr. Fowler. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I get, um, over the last couple of years, I was working with folks um, on this bill. Um, and I guess that, that amount, as an electrical contractor, I'm, I see this amount and I think we are driving up costs because I have done a number of service upgrades from the old 60 amp fuse box to a 200 amp breaker panel and I've never come anywhere near that for the charge that I've charged to my customer. Um, even the 6,000 is not where I'm at. Um, when we put numbers like this out there, um, we are driving up the costs. Are there some contractors out there charging that? Uh, maybe there are, but I'm, I'm a union contractor and I've never come anywhere near that cost. So I would ask that we consider that as we're moving forward. Um, I, I just, I, again, I, I hope I'm not way undercharging, uh, but uh, I guess I, I have to sleep at night also when I do it. And if there are contractors that are out there charging this kind of money for these service upgrades, they're they're milking their customers. That is not the cost. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Fair point on the grant amounts. I know Senator Zhang, you want to say something? Senator Zhang. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick. Um, I think I appreciate your perspective too, uh, but I think some t we were, it might not include the uh, service charge from the utilities, and so I think part of it was trying to incorporate that into this. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just comment that uh, it seems to me that there's a large expansion of the prevailing wage requirement here by applying it to grants of four and six thousand dollars over what requirements are now. Uh, I have already stated at previous meetings about the fact that in many rural areas of the state, the, the state of Minnesota does not have accurate uh, uh, cost information for our labor out there and that the prevailing wage issues raise the cost of these projects well above uh, what um, what they should be or, or, or need to be. And, and I think that uh, what you're doing here uh, by including that is you are going to be artificially raising uh, the costs of the projects in many areas of the state. Thank you, Senator Weber. Senator Zhang. Uh, thank you, Chair Friends and Senator Weber. I, I, I uh, hear your concerns. Um, we, I think for some of the projects here, I think there are exemptions that we have put in the bill, but uh, I, we are working on, continue to work, continue uh, to work on this. And so hopefully um, I can work with you and we can sit and work, try to work something out. Thanks, Senator Zhang. Senator Weber, any follow-up? Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the, the chief author. So I, I just want to pick up where Senator Rarick left off. Could you expand on what, what did you mean when you said that you were accounting for the, the service charge of the, these upgrades by the utilities? I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. Senator Zhang. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Lucero. Um, well, for utilities, I think uh, my testifier can explain it a little bit better than, than I can for you. Mr. Fowler. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, so the, the electric panel upgrade uh, cost depends on a number of factors, and the most variable one um, can be the, the charge from the utility to upgrade the service to the house. And so a little bit more uh, reliable or predictable cost is for the actual box that you see in your basement or your garage. Um, but what can really uh, uh, be, be a surprise factor that will multiply the costs uh, in many cases is having to dig underground um, to, to have uh, uh, higher capacity wires that actually connect the, the, the building to the grid. Thanks, Mr. Fowler. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So having, uh, being one that owns multiple homes that are 
Uh, in fact, some of the homes that I acquired had 60 amp fuse panels, I think was the scenario that Senator Rarick brought up, that I did perform the upgrade. Uh, I've never had to actually upgrade the, the service. So my question is uh, to the testifier, Mr. Chair, how, do you have any idea how much, or I don't know how to phrase this, what percentage of homes in Minnesota might have lines that lead into the panel, so from the pole or street to the, to the panel, whether they're above ground or below ground, that would not ha have the capacity for uh, an upgrade? I think that's for Mr. Fowler, percentage of homes that would not have the upgrade. Mr. Fowler. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, I am I am not aware, uh, off the top of my head, of a of a an estimate for what that looks like across the state. Thanks, Mr. Fowler, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll I'll end with this. Okay, I, if that's since we're talking about this, and I I think it's a very real thing what Senator Warrick is bringing up in in having the the cost here. I've having performed the upgrades, I'm just trying to go in my mind's eye here uh, from 60 amp fuse to I generally don't make all the jump to a 200 amp panel. I think I've generally done to a 100 amp uh, breaker panel. And in those scenarios, it's right around $1,100 is what I've paid. So I, I think it's very real what, what uh, Senator Rarick is bringing up is people are gonna look at this and putting on my hat as a former city council member, when the council as an open body is having to discuss road projects or whatever's happening, there's dollar amounts uh, as part of those conversations and, and the council or these public bodies, they communicate what the dollar amounts are. And guess the mysterious force that happens in the universe. The bids come in right below that dollar amount that we publicly communicated and it's, it's not a coincidence by any means. So, my concern is I think it's, it's very real that we are gonna, if we're communicating $2,500, you're gonna see bids inch up to, to, to not leave money on the table and that's going to drive up unnecessarily then the cost of this, of this service. So uh, the last question of Mr. Chair I would just ask is I, I do see here in the definition of upgrade it's 200 amp. Is, is it the intent, do I understand correctly with the spill language that the, the panels going in are going to be 200 amp. You're not going to allow for anything less than 200 amp. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, that question I think is for the author, but Mr. Fowler, if you want to field that, that's fine as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it is 200 amp is the recognized minimum. And so, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator okay. Zhang. Good to go, Senator Lucero. Um, I have Senator Grunhagen, then we'll go back to Senator Rarick. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Senator Zong, I didn't see there was a cap on administrative fees on this. Um, a lot of the bills do have that. Would you be open to uh, putting in a, like a 3% or something of that nature, maximum administrative fee? Senator Zong. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Chair Friends and Senator Grunhagen. Yes, I would, I would be open to that. There you go, Senator Grunhagen, follow-up. Can I make an oral amendment to cap the administrative cost at 3%? You sure can. Okay, I make that amendment. If you see that as a friendly amendment. Um, thank you, uh, Chair and Senator hang, Grunhagen. Hang, hang, hang on a sec, Senator Zhang and Senator Grunhagen. Let's, have, let's describe the oral amendment and have it read out and then if you want to address whether it's friendly or not, we'll go there. So first, Mr. Mueller, sorry. Mr. Chair, members, there's a couple ways that you could do this. I think for now, for purposes of this amendment, you could say on page three, after line 27, insert subdivision 10, period, administrative expenses, period, a grant under this section shall include administrative expenses not to exceed 3%. Senator Grunhagen, does that conform to your oral amendment? Yes. All right, Senator Zhang, you wanna to respond to the proposal for the amendment? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Grunhagen. I, I hope that we can work on this, because um, I don't know if 3% or is it 5% or 4%. Let, I, I hope that you would be willing to work with me and we could probably work offline and get, come back with a clearer percentage amount. Are you asking Senator Grunhagen to withdraw the amount? I, Otherwise, I, we're gonna I hold on I ask that it. you withdraw and 
Let's okay, I'll let's withdraw try to the work amendment. On it. All right, Senator Grunhagen withdraws the oral amendment. Um, thank you, Senator Grunhagen, for that. You got a promise of conversation there. Okay. Um, if you're done, Senator Grunhagen will go to Senator Rarick. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I wasn't going to talk to this, like so I guess I can't help it at this point. But the the minimum of a 200 amp service, um, and then the comment that that is the kind of the, the industry uh, that is, I would I have run into the situation multiple times with customers uh, wanting to do a panel upgrade because the panel they have is full of circuit breakers and they're convinced they need to go to a 200 amp panel from the 100 amp that they currently have. And the, what I like to do with those customers is I take my ammeter and I ask them to go turn on as many things as they can and we put that amp clamp on their service so they can see exactly what the draw is. Just because a circuit breaker panel is full of breakers and when you add up the numbers of all those breakers and they far exceed the 100 amp main breaker does not mean you are using 100 amps of power or 150 or 280 whatever the breakers add up to. When you're using your electric range, that's a typically on a 50 amp two pole breaker. That doesn't mean you're using that much power for that at all times. And typically uh, you're not using heating and cooling at the same time, so those offset. There, there are so many calculations out there that electrical contractors look at, and I have convinced numerous customers that it is not worth the cost to upgrade from 100 to 200 amps so that you can get more breaker spaces. You either upgrade to a larger 100 amp panel or you put in a sub panel uh, to provide you those extra spaces uh, for that convenience of having different portions of your home on different circuit breakers. Um, the example of the home that and the old homes that were on these uh, fuse boxes that were the entire 120 volt load on the house is on four fuses shows that you can get by with that but for convenience and just and by new codes um, we are separating that out but I, I would hope that we would talk about this that um, especially in homes that have gas appliances where you don't have that electric range or the electric dryer that is uh, using electricity, there should absolutely be ways to do this upgrade and just go to a 100 amp panel. You can operate your air source heat pump off of that. You can operate an electric car charging station that's going, we're not gonna be putting in fast chargers in houses. We're going to be put in putting in overnight chargers. They're not going to take that kind of demand. And typically when people are doing that, they're charging their car, they're not going to be using their electric range at the same time. They're not gonna be doing all this. So in my opinion, a 100 amp uh, service would be great plenty in a vast number of situations. Um, and so we should not be limiting uh, this to that and forcing people to go up to 200 amps if it's not necessarily going to be required. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rick. Senator Jean, final comments before the Mr. Lady Chair, just over. one last question. I'm sorry, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the indulgence. Uh, and I, I, with this glazed conversation here with Senator Rarick, I guess as I was reading this bill, it was my understanding uh, that the intent of the bill was to upgrade and get away from fuse panels. But that may not be the case. Is So uh, my two-part question, Mr. Chair, could the chief author just confirm that is the intent of this bill to upgrade even 100 amp panels or 150 amp panels to 200? Mm -hmm. uh, and then second, that upon reading the definition of electrical panel, I actually now am seeing this, that it is exclusively speaking about breaker panels and you don't make a reference to fuse panels. It says an electrical panel means any panel or sub panel that consists of a main breaker that regulates other circuit breakers to prevent overloading and distribute electricity throughout the building. So is your bill, do you exclude fuse panels uh, as the second question? Because the definition includes breaker panels only and not fuse panels. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Jean. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Franz and Senator Lucero. Uh, I think to the first point, 
the intent of this bill is to help us transition uh, into the 20, as we have the 2040 uh, policy in place, more people will be using more electricity. Uh, you, you know, some of the products that people have been using probably won't be available as we move forward into a more electrified future. And so this is what uh, this bill is trying to get ahead of, and this is what the upgrades are for. And so that's why the 200 uh, amps are what the recognized amount for a modern uh, single family home would be. I think there was a second part no. to the question. Um, Senator Lucero, do you want to review the second part of the question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the second part of the question is, per the definition, you're referring to panel. Do you, I don't see anything in here about fuse panels versus breaker panel. So the question, Mr. Chair, is does the bill allow for fuse panel upgrades? Because that language is not in the definition. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, Mr. Fowler or Senator Jean? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Lucero, uh, for that question. Uh, the intent of this bill is to update the fuses, and so if we need to work on that, uh, I think, you know, we, we will definitely look into it, yeah. Thank you, Senator Jean. Senator Lucero, are you good? Members, we're all good. Any final comments, Senator Jean, before we lay the bill over? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. Um, you know, this is an uh, opportunity to help uh, continue on the work that we've done uh, in the past couple of years to help upgrade our le electrical panels and prepare us uh, for the future. And so thank you, Chair and members, for your support. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Uh, I think there's agreement on the need. There's still some work to do on the cost part. And with that, the bill is laid over. Um, members, we're next going to go to Senate File 2301. Senator Zhang, Minnesota Innovation Finance Authority. Uh, thank you, Chair. And let me just pull out my folder. Sorry, there's a couple of bills. <laughs> A few bills here, um, but uh, Chair, I, I think there's a uh, amendment that should have been passed out uh, recently here with the new amendment. Senator Zhang, we have the A1 amendment. Uh, the A1 amendment, let's see, I would like to adopt that. Want to offer the A1 yeah. amendment? Senator yeah. Zhang offers the A1 amendment. Um, any discussion, members? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A-1, say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The A-1 is adopted. Senator Zhang to the bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, as I pull it out here, uh, the A-1 amendment is uh, work that we've been trying to incorporate uh, from stakeholders. Um, I have before you a bill that creates a Minnesota Climate Innovation Finance Authority, a publicly accountable, mission-driven, sustainable finance authority uh, with the purpose of accelerating the adoption of proven clean energy technologies that will increase the speed and scale of project implementation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the authority's essential objectives are addressing market gaps in accessing in access to financing and serving the communities that have been underserved the most uh, underserved and the most impacted by the climate crisis as the economy community and financial impacts of climate change grow minnesota must continue to take steps to accelerate our transition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transition to a clean energy uh, we know that utilities like the st paul port authority nonprofit leader, uh, lenders, and organizations like CEE, community banks, credit unions, and more are already doing good work in Minnesota to facilitate cr uh, clean energy and energy efficiency, efficiency projects, but there still are gaps uh, and a need is rapidly accelerating the work in Minnesota. There are projects that go unfunded and needs that are being met aren't being met from energy savings projects for nursing homes and low income rural residents to solar and energy storage projects that can help governments 
in smaller rural communities uh, survive winter ice storms and summer heat waves, among others. The Climate Finance Authority could address not only the financing issues, but power purchase agreement issues and the issues that comes with the financing of projects on property that may impact their bond statuses. This bill responds to those gaps and challenges, and this bill provides the opportunities for clean energy business growth in Minnesota by setting up a finance authority similar to the so-called green banks around uh, in other states. Uh, it being an entity uh, with the ability to leverage public and private dollars for sign significant private investments. 17 states uh, already have these clean energy finance ent entities and they have used $2.5 billion in public funds to leverage $9 billion total in investment in clean energy technologies, nearly all from private lenders and investors. Uh, following the model in other states, the authority must become a self-sustaining entity, bringing in revenue to fund continuing operations. Uh, that, that is why we are asking for $45 million in appropriations in this bill uh, to sell, set up the finance authority uh, that will be publicly accountable uh, to uh, the public. Uh, governed by an 11 board, uh, member board with representation from the Department of Commerce, DEED, DL, uh, DALI, the MPCA, and other uh, stakeholders uh, with quali qualifications representing Minnesota and Minnesotans impacted in our clean energy transition. And the authority is required to report back to the legislature with a detailed annual update on progress the community served and the level of private investment leverage. And the time to do this is now. And with that, Chair, I have distinguished guests here to provide their testimony. And Mr. Littman, who has uh, graciously joined us here from Washington, D.C. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Mr. Littman, uh, please identify yourself and present your testimony. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. My name is Henry Littman. I'm Senior Director uh, at the Coalition for Green Capital. The Coalition for Green Capital for over a decade has been the national leader in establishing and supporting green banks around the United States. We were also heavily involved in the creation of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, provision of the Inflation Reduction Act, and manage the American Green Bank Consortium, the association of the nation's existing green banks. Green banks are a proven tool for stimulating public-private investment and emissions-reducing investment across the country. Um, 25 green banks currently operate across 18 states in the District of Columbia, with several more in early stages. Green banks, over their uh, more than a decade-long history, have on average leveraged $3.58 of overall investment for every dollar of public money committed. Uh, it is one of the strongest policy tools available for leveraging private funds into green energy investments. The projects financed have created jobs, reduced energy costs, and lowered air pollution to residents and businesses. They're particularly effective in making sure that low income and disadvantaged communities are included in the clean energy transition. In 2022 alone, green banks around the country mobilized over $1.2 billion of green investment in these areas. Minnesota has ample opportunity uh, for green bank investment and ample need, particularly in its rural, tribal, and low-income areas. The bill that you're considering today, from the national perspective, uh, is considered a gold standard bill uh, with robust consumer protection and accountability standards. It's extremely well designed to mobilize public-private investment in the state and will not compete with existing uh, entities. It will complement them uh, and help them do better. The last thing I'd like to note uh, is that this authority will maximize the state's access to the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, a $27 billion provision within the Inflation Reduction Act to accelerate public-private investment and GHG-reducing investments. Uh, the bill is extremely well aligned in purpose with the fund and sets the state up to receive hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in federal investment over the next decade. Thank you, Mr. Lippman. Mr. Urban. Please uh, identify yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Friends and members of the committee. So I am Julian Nurbin, the Executive Director of Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, and a leader in the Just Solar Coalition. 
And since 2014, we've been making, working to make sure that as Minnesota transitions to a carbon-free energy system, that no one is left behind. As part of our work to engage the public in climate justice solutions, we work to help congregations and small businesses develop solar. Unfortunately, most of the 24 projects that are in our portfolio right now are currently tabled because they're too small to attract the large financiers. We look to this new finance authority to help us solve this problem and to get to yes on thousands of projects across the state. I also wanted to thank the incredible group of partners who you can see listed in the letter in your packet, um, who have come together to support and improve on this very wonky sounding concept. Um, from the Minnesota Environmental Justice Table, Honor the Earth, Community Power, Cure. Um, these are folks who have been part of creating bottom-up community solutions for years uh, without sufficient financing opportunities to bring these concepts to scale. Why, might you ask, do these environmental justice and indigenous rights groups support financial, a finance authority? At the end of the day, it's the little details that make the difference between success and being left behind. Through identifying strategic gaps in funding and working in partnership to get to yes, MNCFA, or this finance authority, will be able to help lift all boats while building a carbon-free economy. Thank you, Ms. Nurbon. I also have a Jeremy Kalin on the list to testify. Mr. Kalin, welcome to the committee. Nice to see you again. If you could identify yourself, please, and give your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and uh, Senators. My name is Jeremy Kalin, K-A-L-I-N. I am an Impact Council attorney, Clean Energy Project Finance attorney in Minneapolis, working all over the country. Um, uh, please don't hold it against me that I also uh, served across the street uh, as a member of the House from Chisago County uh, um, a little more than a decade ago. Um, I reference that because uh, the rural and, uh, and broader agricultural economic opportunities that this bill can unlock are substantial and very exciting. Uh, Chisago County is one of those areas that has some family farms left. Uh, uh, thank goodness, and a lot of pressure on water quality, particularly we have two wild and scenic rivers, the Sunrise and St. Croix rivers. What we know is that there's an opportunity to continue to reduce the uh, pollutants going into rivers by uh, working with, partner, with farmers as partners, uh, as we saw the Nature Conservancy's work with the Mississippi Headwaters Fund, for instance, to pay farmers uh, for upstream uh, shoreline plantings and other true best management practices that reduce phosphorus loading and, and other greenhouse gas emission projects. The reason why I'm so excited about this as kind of a frugal fiscal conservative uh, myself is that we can reduce the need for downstream wastewater treatment plants that are tens and hundreds of millions of dollars of investment for cities. But what's needed is the upstream funding to partner with farmers and that technical assistance, that financial engineering and legal and technical assistance that helps to make the first markets. This nutrient trading concept is done across the river in Wisconsin, uh, in uh, Pacific Northwest and other states, and it's just one of a number of exciting uh, economic development projects that have environmental benefit that could be financed through the, the Climate Finance Innovation Authority or Climate Innovation Finance Authority, excuse me. Um, that makes me quite excited about the bill, in addition to the senior housing and disability infrastructure and other pieces that I think need some attention to help them control costs. Thank you, Mr. Kalin. Uh, any members of the public who wish to testify to Senate File 2301 that are not on our list? Seeing none, we'll go to member questions. Members, do you have any questions here? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author of the bill. <clears throat> First of all, I guess it, it seems to me that we're we're once again growing government here in a huge way. It's like a like a mini version of the federal bank in Minnesota here that we're going to be having the government to take over these loans. But sp specifically on page two, starting at line thirty, uh, you're going to have a loan reserve uh, to uh, protect the private lenders if people uh, default on the loan. Now, where does that money come from? Thank you, Senator Green. This is on the DE, excuse me. Uh, thank you, oh, Senator okay. Green. Oh, Senator sorry. Zhang. Yes, um, I think that that's one of the 
gaps that we're finding that's uh, preventing folks. Oh, sorry, Chair, that's one of the gaps that uh, we're finding that are preventing private lenders from entering into the market and providing the investment into these areas. And uh, Mr. Lippman can speak a little bit more to that, Chair. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Mr. Lippman. Senator, thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, loan loss reserves of the type defined in the bill uh, are one of the highest leverage ways to engage private capital in clean energy investments. The theory of the case being that if you guarantee the investments for some amount of time, the local banks become comfortable with it and then no longer need the supports after they've demonstrated the performance of the asset. Um, so it does come from the money appropriated to the authority, um, but they typically do charge a small fee, almost like an insurance premium for offering it. So a loan loss reserve will typically break even over time. Thank you, Mr. Lettman. Senator Green, any follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so the, the, the money, even though it's a huge amount of money, you're going to spread it out a lot when you're going to not only be setting this thing up, but also uh, uh, guaranteeing loans. But if you, if you couple what we were just talking about over on page 4, starting at, at line 8 through 22, uh, it, it talks about foreclosure on a loan and this, this uh, new agency's ability to acquire its own property and foreclose on loans. And... Uh, um, and, so, and then bad down on 20, uh, line 21, serve as a financial resource to reduce upfront total costs of implementing qualified projects. So it looks like they are, uh, you're going you're gonna to use the, the taxpayer dollars to guarantee the loans but, uh, to the lenders, but is, so who gets foreclosed on? So can the agency then foreclose on the private owner, uh, if, if he doesn't pay the loan back, and then all of a sudden now you've got, you're building up your own property within this agency, yeah. like, like a monopoly bank. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Zhang to the foreclosure issue. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Greenman. Um, so what, what we do know by looking at other states and the previous projects that they've done is that the default rate is less than 0.5% less than 1%. Um, and so um, with the, the, the mechanics of the foreclosure, um, Mr. Kalin can uh, provide more for you. Mr. Kalin, uh, to the foreclosure issue briefly. Mr. Chair and, and Senator Green, um, the language that you see, I believe, was uh, uh, brought over from the Rural Finance Authority that's had broad support. Um, the intent is to uh, not have the authority have any sort of extraordinary powers, but to be subject to all consumer and residential lending laws, as I understand it. And so uh, um, foreclosure is not a common practice, as we have seen in, in uh, the security and collateral and enforcement of default loans. Um, and so I think we'll uh, happy to continue to work with you on those concerns and all others on consumer protection. I believe this may just be a language oversight and having pulled over the general powers from the Rural Finance Authority, but we'll work uh, happy to work through uh, with you, Senator Green, and anyone else interested in making sure that we hold that at bay. I do think the Rural Finance Authority has this authority to do so today, uh, so we should look at when they use that as well. Thank you, Senator Kalin. Sorry, thank you, oh Mr. Kalin. Thank you. <laughs> um, Senator Green, are you good? I want to just make another comment. Right, I understand, and I, and I hear, Mr. Chair, uh, and I hear this all the time. We're going to work with you. We're going to work with you. We've got bills coming through here that obviously aren't ready to come through here. We're working on this and working on that, and yet they're moving through the system. We don't know where they're going to end up. But we are, in this bill, creating an agency, a, a, a state bank, that's going to be, I don't care if it's 0.5%, you're going to be giving loans, guaranteeing them for private lenders, and then apparently going back and foreclosing on the property. You have a right to own property in here, acquisition of property, however you feel it's necessary. This is a horrible bill, and I hope it doesn't move. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. I have Senator uh, Lucero, then Senator Dibble, then Senator Matthews. Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam. Um, Mr. Chair, and I'll, I'll go through these questions as quick as I can. I had to step out for a moment there, uh, so I may have missed it if you already said it, but on line 8.12 of the uh, uh, A1, 
you have uh, dots as a placeholder for a date. Is there a reason for that? Senator Jean. Uh, thank you, Chair. Let me, as I pull uh, The line was 8.12. Oh, yes, yeah, so that, that one is, um, we're, we're looking to, to see, I think it was in part of, so the, the intent of that portion is that to ensure that uh, we have uh, a strategy going in so that we are not uh, over, we're not re reinventing the cycle. Uh, the date uh, is one that we will look to plug in later as uh, we're working through the different committees. Uh, Mr. Kalen can speak a little bit to the specifics of a time. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Mr. Kalen, briefly. Uh, briefly, Mr. Chair and, uh, and Senator Sarah, the goal is to adopt an investment strategy uh, through community input and input of legislators, et cetera, as soon as possible, but not rushing that process, and that it uh, create the overarching uh, work of the of the authority. Uh, so that date needs to be figured out uh, in terms of mechanics of when that's an appropriate timeline. Thank you, Mr. Galen. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And well, to Senator Green's point, if you don't have a date yet, how am I supposed to, and members of this committee, supposed to vote on a piece of legislation uh, to move it forward or whatever's going to happen? I don't even know what the action is if we're holding it over. It's a good point, Senator Lucero. It's the intention to send this with a recommendation to pass to the state government, local government, and veterans committee. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it's not ready for prime time. If, if you're still developing a strategy, per the words of uh, the chief author, if it's still a work in progress, well, this committee is supposed to evaluate the totality of the language before us, but the language is incomplete. So how are we supposed to vote on a, a, a make a recommendation at all on incomplete language? So that Lu creates a, a challenge. Uh, that's a rhetorical no, question, Mr. Uh, Chair. Senator Lucera, I should mention that it is the intention for state government to send it back here. So just to your point, you have the floor. Um, the intention is to send this to state government, have it come back here. Uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, to send it out of this committee with a re recommendation regardless is to have complete language. And I think it's premature for this committee to send it anywhere in an incomplete state, even if it's going to come back to us. The question I would have then, Mr. Chair, beyond my rhetorical one, uh, I'm seeing here on line 8.31, the authority, uh, authority investments are not to be made solely to reduce private risk. Well, when I think of banks and institutions, it's all about risk and return on investment and how to mitigate those risks and, and potential costs. And when I see deliberate language to not solely reduce risk, my question, Mr. Chair, to the Chief Author is, could you explain what is it that is meant by th this language that we see on line 8.31? Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Zhang, line 8.31. Explanation, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, so I, I wanted to make it clear that this is not a bank per se. It's a, we're looking to create a finance authority uh, with, uh, with public dollars that are put in there. And the intent of this bill is to address the climate crisis that we're, we are in. Um, and so that's, the, I think that's where the language is coming from. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Senator Lucero, follow up. Uh, just a final comment. When we're using taxpayer dollars and we're going to be, uh, acting in the quasi-capacity of, of a lending institution to flat out admit that uh, risk or ensuring the fiduciary responsibility of, of dollars are not as protected as they, they should be by saying it's, it's going to be the state of policy to not solely reduce risk, that's a concern for me. That's a huge concern. So the last I would have, and it wouldn't be a, a question, but it's, it's more of a comment. I see on line 8.24, it speaks about how the values of equity, environmental justice, and geographic balance can be integrated into all investment operations. Well, I'm familiar with what the value of equality is and being equal under the law. But I, I, and I looked in the definition, I don't see in the definition section here a definition for equity. So while I know what equality is and the, the, the 
fundamental framework of our republic of equality. I, I'm not familiar, familiar with what the value of equity is. But again, that's not a question, Mr. Chair. It's more of just a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Zhang, for bringing this bill. Um, I was reading through um, this, this brief here, and I was looking back at all the uh, examples, the grid of all the examples of projects that were made possible by similar efforts uh, in other states. And it's, uh, it's pretty exciting to see some of the, some of the initiatives um, that might be possible here that wouldn't otherwise be possible. But my question, Mr. Chair, is um, also uh, reading off the, the background sheet um, and responding to the, the presentation, there's a whole suite of tools um, that might be deployed uh, with this particular initiative. I'm just curious if, if Mr. Littman or Mr. Kalin or yourself can tell me what, what are the uh, barriers or the opportunities that present the most in other places? What has been the experience? Has it been um, you know, the credit enhancements, um, co-investments um, to leverage private capital, um, you know, the subsidized loans, bringing interest rates lowers? Um, I'm just curious, what, what, would, what would we anticipate in Minnesota to be the major thrust? Um, Senator Zhang will give you one of the two testifiers on that one. You thank choose. You. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, I think we, I would like to hand, give this over to Mr. Littman as he is joining us, and I want to maximize our opportunity to pick his brain on the issue. Uh, Senator Dibble, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Uh, different tools that exist have slightly different goals. So if you're relying more on credit enhancements, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to engage the most possible private capital, um, but maybe there are some first-of-a-kind transactions or more complex types of things um, that would require the Green Bank to put more of its own money into play um, that would get less attention. So um, in Minnesota, the need that I see is for, for some credit enhancement for things like residential energy improvements to make sure that every household has access to that. Um, but I also see substantial need for co-investment on more innovative uh, projects, particularly in um, you know, industrial and transportation space, uh, where there's some more technical innovative work that needs to happen as well on the financing side. Thank you, Mr. Littman. Senator Dibble. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. I now have Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if the author could go over some of the comments that you made in the beginning of your bill um, on that the, that the finance authority would be uh, open and transparent uh, and open to the public. Uh, I'd like to know, are they uh, will this be subject to open meeting laws, uh, data requests, all of that, uh, Lane? And I'll, I guess I'll break this up into a few parts. Can start from there. All right. Thank you, Senator Matthews. And where in the bill? Thank you, Senator Matthews. On transparency, Senator Zhang, data request, open meeting laws. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Matthews. As you look in subdivision 10, uh, we, we have the the authorities, board of directors. Uh, we, we also have, uh, you know, the, the report and auditing in uh, subdivision 11 that they are uh, required to do to provide for us. The board members, if you look at subdivision 10, uh, section J and K, um, well, section G through K, you have there that the board of members are up for uh, renewal and reappointment uh, in two revolving in, in, uh, revolving two full terms, and so uh, you know they they will be subject to legislative oversight uh, with the report and the audit. We have uh, a report that it's required that is comprehensive that must be reported back to the state legislature. Um, the lending authority, itself, lending authority itself is subject to uh, federal uh, and state lending laws. If you look at the uh, section, 
six, subdivision three, uh, we have the, the lending rules that they are uh, subject to, and it, it is also subject to the Minnesota uh, data, data Practices Act. And so I hope this answers uh, your first question. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, thank you. Trying to page uh, over to that last reference. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Can someone bring me the DE3 amendment or the DE amendment? I'm sure the pages could I help out with that. I am working off of the original one here. That makes sense. But, but the, the sub, subsections are still the same th that I mentioned. All set, Senator Zhang? Yeah. All right, Senator uh, Matthews. Mr. Chair, thank you. So that's a that's partial answer, um, although the audit that you mentioned looks like they're reporting and auditing themselves, and so we're looking circular there. You, know, you might consider the OLA or some outside entity that is trusted, uh, a trusted independent source uh, doing an audit because I don't see... Uh, an unbiased outside uh, authority that's auditing it. I see an internal audit. Um, I was going to ask about why all of the members yeah. are appointed by the governor and why the vast majority of them seem to be uh, commissioners. Um, that, that doesn't uh, scream transparency uh, at me either. Um, and there's, there's the reports that are sent to the legislature, but the, seems very limited as far, I mean, what do we do with reports all the time? We, we uh, the legislature tends to sit on them and these boards uh, continue to do uh, whatever it is they're doing. I, I struggle to see where there is the transparency at the level that Minnesotans should expect with such a large investment of taxpayer dollars. If you're doing a private, and this is, Kind of to my second point, if you created this up and got, yeah, I think you could easily get 45 million uh, in private uh, uh, capital that are put up for doing the same kind of work because there are billionaires all over the place that are trying to help on green projects and climate projects and all of that. So I don't think that would be uh, any problem uh, whatsoever. Uh, but with the use of taxpayer dollars, I don't see a direct link for the taxpayer themselves to be able to help influence or question uh, decisions that are made uh, based off these tax dollars. I see links through commissioners and through members that are also appointed by the governor, but no direct accountability link right from this governing board uh, to the taxpayer and then a self-reported internal audit. So I think you should look at some of these uh, and, and uh, consider uh, opening them up for more scrutiny and more uh, more transparency. Thank you, Senator Matthews. I agree with you. Um, a note, Senator Zhang, is that from state government would be the hope to send this to Commerce, which has some banking regulation, some transparency authority. Uh, we have the chair here, and hopefully some of those questions can be answered. But time will tell. Senator Matthews. And Mr. Chair, I couldn't, when I saw this on the agenda this morning, I couldn't help but think, uh, after this weekend, this is like the worst possible weekend to bring a new banking concept here to the legislature. Have faith, Senator Matthews. Well, you, you mentioned that, but on the flip side, you say, oh, it was, this is private rather than public. The other headline was there are more indictments over public-run uh, financing programs. So it just spells the need for more transparency uh, and more sunlight all the way around. I think the point about transparency is a good one. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Uh, have Senator Hoffman and then Senator McEwen. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and so uh, the thing, and, and I was I was asking myself a question, not that I'm you know, being Michigan on the whole place, but in this thing, isn't it fair to assume this is you're leveraging money from the state of Minnesota, the investment, in order, because the feds are moving in a direction that other states are going, correct? Mm -hmm. And, and, and not, that I, not that I would graduate from Yale and I want to go do something at Harvard or, or vice versa. That's supposed to be funny, uh, Mr. <laughs> Littman. But the, the thing here is you have the potential as a state, we have the potential as a state, right, to leverage money in order for the feds to give us, I don't know, 300 million or something. And I think there was a handout that I had 
seen this morning that that showed that and you might have it in the package yeah. no you do have it in the packets in here so is if this is the case is there a are there timelines are you seeing because there was other states that have already you know taken advantage and it's your federal tax dollars i mean this is this is money that you should be coming back to the state of minnesota on. so why wouldn't it make sense for you to leverage a dollar to get three to ten dollars more back in and so help me understand that is in the time sensitivity about how you need to do this. Um, Senator Zhang, who used to be from the other body where the person next to you was from the other body. So Senator Zhang, could you help me understand that for Thank folks? Thank you, Senator Hoffman and Senator Zhang. Before you answer the use of the words time sensitive, I caught that. Uh, we still have four more bills to go. So if you could briefly, to the good Senator's point. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Hoffman. Uh, there are our fund and guidance from the EPA and the green funding from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and Mr. Uh, Littman can answer that uh, quickly, too. Answer it yeah, very, very, quick, very quickly. Um, so EPA is going to start getting money out uh, probably in the middle of 2024, and it's all going to be out uh, by October of 24. So... That doesn't mean that it all needs to be here by then, but it will be moving in the process. So um, there is an urgency to be running before then and being able to demonstrate legitimate uses for the funds probably by middle end of next year. Thank you, Mr. Littman. Senator Hoffman. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Mm -hmm. I thought your point was a good one. Um, we're leveraging some federal dollars for some good projects. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Last on my list. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Senator Zhang, for bringing this bill. I just wonder if um, perhaps um, one of the experts um, who is um, here in support of the bill could speak briefly. I know we have a lot to, to go still today. Um, to the need for the creation of this authority. Uh, you know, we, we've heard a little um, intimation to her. We got billionaires apparently all over the country and world wanting to do um, uh, move things to green energy. Why is it important specifically to do something like this? What's different about this and what, what are the projects that we're looking to fund that, I mean, are they just not funding them? What's going on? Thanks. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Senator Zhang, you have a couple experts there. Why don't you yeah. tee one of them up for that Thank you, Chair, excellent and question. thank you, Senator McEwen, for your question and hand it off to Mr. Littman. Um, thank you, Senator, for the question. It's, it's a very good one. Uh, I guess, you know, if there are billionaires that are willing to fund all these projects, where are they? <laughs> um, why, you know, why, why haven't they been funded? I, I would say more seriously, um, the real gap that we've seen in the clean energy transition so far is that um, low-income communities have been left behind, and that's because they don't have um, the financial infrastructure in place, they don't have the supply chains in place, um, they don't have the access to credit. And so President Biden has made this a centerpiece of his climate agenda. In fact, he said just as 40, 40% 40 of his investment must go to these communities. Um, and so you know, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is a key piece, linchpin of that agenda. So I think what you will see is a real push on the federal side to make sure that this money in particular, this federal money that will be used in concert with, with the money appropriated to this bill, um, will be used to do really strong greenhouse gas reduction projects in communities that have historically not gotten that kind of investment. Thank you, Mr. Littman. Senator McEwen. Thank you. appreciate that. All right. Members, Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, I'd like to request a roll call on the bill. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Zhang, before we put this to a vote and send it to state government, any final comments? Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. I, I urge your support for this bill. It's an opportunity for us uh, to leverage both private and federal money to help move us our state forward. Um, you know, we, we, I know that there's a little bit of more work to do, and we look forward to engaging in further conversation uh, and, you know, look forward to our meeting, our next hearing, hopefully in state gov, and I urge your support. Thank you, Senator Zhang. With that, um, Senator Mitchell moves that Senate file 2301 be recommended to pass and sent to the state, local, and veterans committee. The clerk will now call the roll. Senator Friend? Aye. Senator Zhang? Aye. Senator Matthews? No. 
Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Green? No. Senator Grunhagen? No. Senator Hoffman? Aye. Senator Klein? Yes. Senator Lucero? Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Mitchell? Yes. Senator Port? Yes. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Weber? No. Senator Lucero? I think we're required to have Senator Port state her location. Senator Port, can you hear us? Yes, Burnsville, Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Port. There being eight yes votes and five no votes, the motion prevails and the bill is sent to state gov. Thank you, Senator Zhang. All right, members, we have about 45 minutes left. Um, this would probably be a good point to mention that if we're not able to get through the agenda today and on Wednesday afternoon, we're going to try to come back Wednesday night. Um, Senator Zhang, I've got Senate file 2462. This is the last Zhang bill of the day. And I see you have two testifiers, uh, Dr. Kabalon and Dr. Weinkoff. If you could both come forward, please, for your testimony. Senator Zhang. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. Uh, I think it's... Um, thank you for uh, indulging me and allowing me to be here. Uh, next is Senate File 2462. It's a bill that authorizes funding for critical microgrid research training here in Minnesota. The bill before you is requesting funding for the Center of Research at the University of St. Thomas within their School of Engineering. Funding that will be coming from the Renewable Development Account. Uh, I have two testifiers with, here with me that will be expanding further on microgrids and what it is and the projects that are being conducted in St. Paul. Um, as some, some of you may already know, this facility is in St. Paul. There's a testing facility um, where folks from all over come to, to do their testing and research. Uh, two years ago, uh, the first $5.4 million brought in uh, 11, $11 million in federal funds that had been committed. The additional funding that we are asking could bring in additional $25 million from the federal government. I think it is a great opportunity where money we invest in Minnesotans would bring in additional federal investments right back to Minnesota. Also in, in researching and develop, development that not only benefits Minnesotans, but our country. This is an investment in Minnesota's ingenuity and innovation. Um, and so for before I turn it over, just for some clarification for the language of how this bill has been written and why it, it kind of looks like this, uh, the total asking amount is 7.1, uh, but there was money that were given in previous uh, biennium that we are uh, very open to clarify the language if needs be. Uh, but I would uh, turn it over to the testifiers. Thanks very much, Senator Zhang. Um, whichever testifier prefers to go first, please introduce yourself. I'm hoping for testimony of two or three minutes and then fire away. All right. My, well, my name is Don Weinkoff. I'm the Dean of Engineering here at the University of St. Thomas. And I have with me uh, Dr. Mahmoud Kabalan, uh, who is the uh, director for the Center uh, for Microgrid Research. Uh, and I also, I might add, is also the recent recipient of the National Science Foundation's Career Award, specifically uh, for his work uh, with microgrid systems. And so we'll just take a couple minutes today to summarize this proposal. Um, but quickly, but since many of you might not be familiar with the School of Engineering at St. Thomas, uh, believe it or not, uh, one in six students at the University of St. Thomas studies in the School of Engineering. Last year, we produced over 400 bachelor's and master's degrees in the various degrees of civil engineering, computer engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, software engineering, and data science. And so we are a significant technical workforce engine for the state of Minnesota. 
So microgrids are uh, critical components of the modern electric grid, enabling a resilient and reliable power supply as we transition to larger and larger percentages of renewable energy. And when we last uh, talked to this committee, we had pledged uh, to build um, uh, a, a, a real world, real scale um, microgrid research center, uh, which would attract partners from across the nation. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the slides that we have in front of us. I'm plugged in here, but uh, let's, in the interest of time, uh, we're on slide two. And today, the design of this center uh, and its early stage capability, and I think you have these, these uh, in your packet. Thank you. Uh, and in fact, uh, right now, as, as Senator Zhang has said, we're in the process of finalizing an $11 million project with the Department of Defense. This is $11 million of additional funds that will largely be spent right here in the state of Minnesota, educating our power systems workforce and engaging students in microgrid system integration, battery storage, and control technologies. Um, and um, I, I thought I would highlight, Dr. Uh, Senator Zhang uh, had uh, given us a breakdown of, of some of the elements of the request, uh, but I would like to highlight that 4.1 of this is a new request to expand the center even further, uh, which will almost be unparalleled in the nation uh, and nationally lead to expanded partnerships uh, with, that will come with this new functionality. So in the end, uh, the facility will be highly versatile, real world, at scale, working laboratory for both students and working professionals uh, and a testing and validation site uh, for new technologies from companies here in the state of Minnesota or the region uh, that want to evaluate their products. And I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Kabbalan uh, to tell us a little more about the facility uh, and the center. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Weinkopf. Dr. Kabbalan, why don't you identify yourself and present your testimony, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Kabbalan. I'm professor of engineering at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, as Dean Weinkoff shared, we are building something truly special here in Minnesota. I am very proud of St. Thomas's stewardship's, stewardship of the RDA funds to date, and I'm excited to share what is possible with additional investment. With initial state funding and further investment from St. Thomas, the center has developed into one of the premier microgrid hands-on research and educational facilities in the nation. It is truly a unique facility with the potential to create incredible and relevant research and workforce development opportunities. Uh, just in, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some, some information that we have on microgrids, but I'll be happy to, to answer those in the Q&A. Q uh, just to give you a scale, a sense of the scale of the, the things that we're doing at the center, uh, while some programs might have access to lab facilities that could power something on the scale of one to two households, the system at St. Thomas would be able to power up to 1,000 homes. Uh, such a facility does not exist in Minnesota today. Uh, two years ago, we promised that through the RDA investment, the center would attract significant national interest and research collaborations to Minnesota. As Dr. Weinkoff mentioned, we are seeing that vision manifest in the current $11 million additional research grant funding from federal sources. And if we can expand the facilities capabilities through this request, we are in early discussions of an additional $25 million federal investment to develop microgrid pilot systems here in the state of Minnesota based on the model we built at St. Thomas. This would include a novel, resilient microgrid system that we would help design and build out at the Minnesota National Guard facility at Camp Ripley. These projects will serve as national models for microgrid systems and will place Minnesota in a leadership role in this space. We would be happy to share the details of this planned facility expansion through this request, which is detailed in the slides 9 and 10 of your packet. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to the summary of our partnerships on slides 6 through 8 in your packet. Uh, the center's mission is to connect our work with our community both locally and nationally. From our launch, we have actively built a strong array of national and local partnerships, corporate and nonprofit. Several of those partners provided strong letters of support for the work that we are doing. Thank you. Thank Chair you, Friends, doctor. I just have a closing statement, if you will. Okay. Uh, Senator Zhang, thank you. Members of the committee, we want to thank you again for your time today. This 
we'll conclude our comments. Uh, the RDA is explicitly designed to, number one, support research and development of renewable electric and energy technologies, and then number two, encourage grid modernization, including control, storage, and microgrid systems. This proposal directly addresses the legislative intent of the RDA fund while promising significant outside leveraging of these ratepayer resources, as well as commitment to education and workforce development. So as we move forward with our carbon-free 2040 goals, it's critical that we have commit to developing the technologies and the training essential for a sustainable, reliable, and resilient electric grid system, which microgrids will play an undeniably vital role. And so through your steering of the RDA funds two years ago, um, we have taken a leadership role uh, and we will be significantly strengthened uh, by the additional funds that were requested here. So we urge your support of, of SF2462 and be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Doctor. We're going to go to member questions. I have Senator Matthews. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Zhang. Um, so I am, I'm not opposed to the bill. Uh, St. Thomas met with me this morning and explained the concept, and I, I think I'm good with that. I do have a math question, and I know we all ran for the legislature hoping that there would be no math on this exam. Uh, but I'm wondering if the author or maybe our Senate Council could help clarify uh, these different numbers, because the first uh, section one has a three million and then 0.4 and 0.4, and the last page has 4.1 million, so that leaves a $300,000 hole if that's together. Or if they're not together, then what are the two separate appropriations for? And then those numbers still don't add up to the 7.1 number that was mentioned. So I'm wondering if we could have clarity on the math in the bill. Senator Matthews, before I turn that over to Mr. Mueller, glad to report great minds think alike. Um, we just went over that privately and now glad to have uh, Mr. Mueller give a, um, an explanation. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Mr. Mueller. Um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Matthews and, and members, there are sort of two different appropriations in this bill. Um, paragraph A is appropriating $3 million the first year and then $400,000 the second year, and then it sets a base level for $400,000 in 2027 for research at the, um, the microgrid, uh, the St. Thomas Center for Microgrid. The second appropriation is on top of that in paragraph C is $4.1 million in order for matching money also for the microgrid. So the three million in paragraph A and then the 4.1 in paragraph C gets you the 7.1. The other issue here is of wrinkle. that three million. Wrinkle. <laughs> wrinkle, Mr. Chairman. Of that three million, one million was already in the base. So but we have to reappropriate that. So it's, it's basically two million over the top of the base budget. And then the 4.1 is also over the base. So that gets, so 7.1, 6.1 million is over the base. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Senator Matthews. So Mr. Chair and Mr. Mueller, we're not counting the two years of $400,000 in the overall total is how you're getting to the math then. Mr. Mueller. Mr. Chairman and Senator Matthews, yes, I was just counting the first year. The second year would be another 400000 on top of the 7.1. Okay. Thank you. Senator Matthews, you're good. Members, everybody good? Senator Zhang, any final comments? It is our intention to lay the bill over for possible inclusion. Senator Zhang, final comments? Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the testifiers uh, coming here and presenting this bill. Uh, there are many exciting things going on at... Uh, University of St. Thomas and their uh, School of Engineering, and I look forward to seeing this bill pass and more funding coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Zhang. With that, uh, the bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Zhang, you are finally done with your day's work. Now we'll hear Senate File 2201, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, doctors, for your testimony. All right. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chief Chair, Senate, I'm here to Senate File 2201, Senator yes. Dibble. Uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to present Senate File 2201. Uh, what 
uh, it would seek to achieve, Mr. Chair, uh, would be an, at, to add an update to Minnesota's sustainable building guidelines to include resiliency uh, in light of climate changes that affect temperature and precipitation. It would speak to both one-time events and long-term trends. Namely, Mr. Chair, members, our weather is getting warmer and wetter, and um, it would seek to add to the sustainable building guidelines so that our state buildings would be adapted to those uh, circumstances. Um, just by way of a quick reminder, the sustainable building guidelines were created in 2001 uh, for new construction funded by bonding dollars. 2008 uh, was an update that would include uh, major renovations. And it deals with topics such as air quality, lighting, healthy environments, productivity improvements, uh, reduction of costs, both in terms of materials and operating costs and energy efficiency, and it's construed across five categories. That's how they organize the sustainable building guidelines um, by performance management, uh, site and water, energy and atmosphere, indoor environmental quality, uh, materials and waste. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have uh, Mr. Richard Graves, um, who is the director and associate professor at the Center for Sustainable Building Research at the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. Who Thank you. Us? Thank you, Senator Dibble. Mr. Graves, if you could please identify yourself and then present your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is uh, Richard Graves, and I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Building Research uh, at the University of Minnesota. I have uh, two sets of slides uh, that I won't show, but are in your packets uh, for information. Uh, and um, we provide, uh, at the center, we provide technical assistance to the Departments of Administration and Commerce for the sustainable building guidelines and work with project teams to support their work. Uh, SF 2201 would expand the Minnesota building guidelines to include uh, resilience with, the sust with sustainability uh, as a goal. Um, for, for, context, um, for context, some definitions. Sustainability is the ability uh, of a building and its occupants to impact or benefit the environment, social, uh, and economics in its construction and operations. And the, and the B3 guidelines are already um, authorized to promote sustainability uh, within them. Um, this bill would let them uh, have resilience as a goal, and resilience is the ability of a building and its occupants to respond, absorb, adapt to, and recover uh, from uh, disruptive events. Also, for a bit of context, in 2018, MPCA uh, made requests for resilience to be included um, in the, the B3 guidelines, and as a result of that, uh, at the center, we did a research report that looked at what it, what it would take to include resilience uh, within the B3 guidelines. What we found uh, in that work that many aspects of the current guidelines have uh, overlap between sustainability and resilience, and so therefore there's resilience benef some resilience benefits uh, in the current guidelines. In addition, that research uh, created a, a resilience planning tool that can be used for projects um, all across Minnesota and pulls data at the county level on hazards and risks and other, other items for projects to use as a planning tool when they're, uh, when they're planning projects, not just state-funded projects, but could be a useful tool for, for any project. And so, uh, finally, the thing the report did find is the current, current statutes only allow guidelines that intersect with sustainability. So the only items we could integrate within the guidelines were things that had both sustainability and resilience benefits. Uh, SF2201 would allow items that only provide resilience benefits to be integrated into the, into the guidelines. And some examples of those are uh, requiring a resilience planning project, planning process uh, for projects, uh, site and water design uh, for flood protection and, and mitigation, uh, energy using future climate files uh, for energy design, uh, indoor environmental quality issues such as um, thinking about passive survivability uh, for projects to upgrade their exterior envelopes more than just for energy efficiency but to hold in energy in hot times or cold climb times if uh, power was disconnected uh, to the buildings. And then also some material issues, looking at fortified standards for 
roof and exterior envelope design, uh, specifying impact resistance and other security standards for some uh, building design requirements. Uh, and, and other items. So thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Graves. Uh, members of the public who wanted to testify to the bill that did not get on the list, seeing none, we'll go to members' questions. Seeing none, three, two, one, Senator Grunhagen. All right. Um, it's our intention to lay the bill over. Nice job, Senator Dibble. Did you want to make any final comments before we lay it over? Uh, um no, I appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Chair, and appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you. Thank you for that, Senator. Mr. Graves, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, thank thanks you. for coming to the committee with that. The bill is... Hang on, Senator Dibble. <laughs> having a little discussion about whether it's laying over or going to state government. Just bear with us for a moment, Senator Dibble. All right, members, as I clearly stated, um, we're going to have to pass this with a recommendation to the state government committee. Given that, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? bill is recommended to pass and sent to state, local government, and veterans. Thank you again, Mr. Graves. Thank you again, Senator Dibble. And with that, we're now going to hear Senator Dibble's Senate File 2267. Welcome back, Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have two bills on the agenda. Can't quite match my good friend Senator Zhang with three, but we'll try to make it interesting for everyone. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 2267. Thank you as well to my co-authors, Senators Zhang, Klein, McEwen, and Port. Mr. Chair and members, uh, Senate File uh, 2267 would provide uh, grants to income qualified households to help them with their energy bills. Um, it would establish um, uh, the qualifying threshold. Um, right now that threshold floats up and down according to the amount of federal funds that come in between 50% and 60% of state median income. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's a supplement to our LIHEAP program, our Low Income uh, Heat and Energy Assistance Program. Um, these would be the last dollars into the program, um, so it would be a, a supplement uh, to those. The emphasis, uh, Mr. Chair, is on reaching more families rather than just increasing the size of the grants to the families who now receive those grants. It's estimated another 15 to 20,000 families per year would be helped. Right now we serve about 126,000 uh, families in Minnesota. Two thirds of those are in greater Minnesota, one third are in the metro area. It has an outreach component uh, to the proposal so that we can reach those additional households. And Mr. Chair, very importantly, it would uh, um, be a program that would last throughout the year, uh, inclusive of the summer months where shutoffs are more likely to happen than in the winter months. And we, of course, know that uh, with the increasing hot summers and the use of air conditioning, energy bills can get uh, quite uh, steep, quite expensive in the summer. And it's very, very important, uh, becoming more important to be able to maintain your air conditioning uh, in the summertime. Um, it's a stable source of funding that would be construed over five years. The reason it needs to be stable over that period of time is because right now um, the program is kind of stood up uh, uh, you know, a new every year um, just for a few months and if it's going to become more of a year-round uh, program, uh, this funding needs to be a little more predictable and a little more stable. It's of course paired with two other programs as LIHEAP is with weatherization so that people's houses can be weatherized, made more energy efficient, bring down their energy costs over the long term. Um, and it would also coincide with uh, a program that people could qualify for while they're applying for these funds that would actually put them into a, to a program where they would have a cap on their energy, energy bills if they qualify that would be uh, sensitive and responsible to their income percentage. That is my proposal, Mr. Chair. Oh, I do have a... I was going to say, Senator Dibble, we have an A2 here. Yeah, I do too. It's around here somewhere. But All right. I don't know if I Senator Dibble me, offers the A2 amendment. Any discussion to the A2? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A2 Amendment to Senate File 2267, say aye. 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 All opposed? The A2 is adopted. 
to the bill as amended. Senator Dibble, are we ready to have your testifiers? Yes, Mr. Chair. I have Ms. Levinson Falk and Ms. Talk. If you want to come forward, please. Ms. Levinson Falk, welcome back to the committee. Nice to see you. If you could please identify yourself and then um, present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, members. I'm Annie Levinson Falk with the Citizens Utility Board of Minnesota. Uh, we brought forward this bill to respond to serious issues of affordability that Minnesotans have been facing, um, especially given the recent rise in energy costs. Um, it's very difficult when somebody calls a citizen's utility board in June um, because their utility service is about to be shut off and we have to tell them that there's no assistance available. Um, sometimes people weren't aware of the energy assistance program when it was open or sometimes people thought they applied only to find out that there was a paperwork issue that prevented their application from going through. Um, we usually tell people at that point that to look for help from family or um, a food shelf or a local house of worship. And when they've exhausted those options, then the conversation shifts to gently suggesting it, it might be time to think about where else they can stay for a while. Um, for a renter, that can mean losing their housing entirely. Um, you're well aware, I know, that fuel costs have been increasing for everyone um, and that it's been especially felt by, by people who use heating oil. Um, which is basically diesel. I mean, all of those costs have come down a bit, but if, uh, if you drive a diesel vehicle, you know that that's, it's just still quite expensive. Um, even under more normal circumstances, energy costs are generally uh, higher in rural areas with delivered fuels and in tribal nations. Um, and overall, residential customers in Minnesota owe on average twice as much on their utility bills as they did four years ago. The need is great, and the current energy assistance program isn't keeping up. This bill will help. As Senator Dibble said, it provides ex assistance through an existing program, so there's no new administrative structures that need to be stood up. It allows energy assistance to be open through the summer to help people deal with cooling costs and to be there when there's a shutoff notice that comes. Um, and I wanted to share um, a couple of changes that have been made in the last few days to the bill. Um, first, in response to feedback from the utilities, the outreach spending cap in the bill um, is set at the same amount as it is under federal funds. So the administrative and outreach costs um, are capped at the same amount as, as they are with the federal LIHEAP dollars. Um, and second, the amendment that's adopted today corrects a few of the drafting errors in the House bill. Other than that, it's just um, uh, some changes from House research to get it into a form that they were more comfortable with. Um, and in addition to the amendment that um, you adopted just now, um, there's two further, further reporting requirements that are being considered based on um, feedback from the health House a few days ago. Um, one is to require reporting of all organizations that receive funding for the administration and outreach of the program so that the legislature is aware of where those are going. Um, and the second is to report on the number of energy assistance recipients who also receive weatherization services. Um, I fully expect those changes to be made. Um, should the bill move forward, they just weren't ready for today's hearing. Thank you um, very much for the opportunity to speak, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Ms. Levinson Falk. Ms. Tuck, welcome to the committee. If you could please identify yourself and present your testimony. Um, buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Friends and members of the committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Uh, for the record, my name is Rosa Tuck. I am the executive director of the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. The council, as you know, is a state agency in the executive branch tasked to advise on policy and legislation that pertains and, and is beneficial for uh, Latino Minnesotans. I am here to testify in strong support of this bill. Uh, thank you, Senator Dibble, for being the chief author. Uh, during our community listening sessions uh, last summer, uh, in preparation for this legislative session, we heard many stories from uh, our youth and their families about uh, real financial hardships that they are experiencing like other uh, families uh, across the state. And uh, many of these difficulties are a result of uh, still recovering from the pandemic crisis and from the rise of prices of food and other basic services. As we know, uh, fuel and natural gas prices remain volatile, and, and this bill will help many of our low-income families with the current costs of energy, not only during the fall winter, but also during the summer, especially nowadays when we know that uh, they tend to be much hotter. Also, qualifying for this program may allow someone to qualify for other assistance, uh, for instance, to insul insulate their homes or replace their furnace. This bill puts focus on outreach to underserved community, communities, which will help with access 
and close racial disparities. In the recent past, the Council has partnered with the Department of Commerce to inform Latino households about the energy assistance program. Should this bill be passed, the Council looks forward to supporting the Department and other organizations with outreach to make sure that these services and programs go to more households. For this and other reasons explained today, I urge you to support and vote in favor of this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Stock, and thank you for your reference to outreach. Um, I think that's a helpful part of the bill. Um, just real quick, Senator Rarick, any members of the public who want to testify, we do have an online testifier that I'd like to go to before member questions. Seeing nobody here, uh, I show on the list uh, Lisa Drew. Ms. Drew, are you there? Hi, yes, thank you, Ms. Mr. Drew. Chair and members of the committee. Welcome to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lisa Drew, and I am the Director of the Community Development Department at TRICAP. The community development programs at TRICAP include the energy programs of LIHEAP and weatherization. TRICAP's administ administrative offices are located in Waite Park and our designated service area is central Minnesota counties of Benton, Sherburne, and Stearns. TRICAP's focus is helping people to become financially self-sufficient. And for some programs like energy assistance, the work that we do helps families to meet their basic needs like a warm home. Across all of our programs in a year, TRICAP will serve between 13,000 and 15,000 families. Our service area, the population is divided into 60% urban and 40% rural. And of that rural population, 40% is made up of seniors age 65 and over. As the energy assistance service administrator in Stearns, Benton, Sherburne, and Morrison counties. Last year with energy assistance, we served 6,975 households. 40% of those were families with people 65 and over. This year, what we've seen is with smaller grant sizes than last year, and income eligibility is at set at 50% of state median income instead of the 60% that we were able to serve last year. As of March 7th, our energy assistance grants for our service area have been $2.3 million. Last year, March 7th, for that same period, they were just over 5 million. At this point in time, our crisis applications are up 20% over last year. And in a lot of cases, what we're seeing happening is those crisis applications are coming in immediately at the same time as the primary grants. And this is germane to that rural population that I mentioned when we're thinking about delivered fuels. With a minimum primary grant of $200, Households are not able to get even one fuel delivery without combining that primary with some crisis, which can go up to $1,500. This can make it difficult to help families meeting their basic needs when combined with the inflation that we're all aware of for basic needs. TRICAP supports this supplemental funding as it will provide additional crisis funding and it increases the income eligibility to assist people with their heating costs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drew. Um, no other witnesses. We're going to go to member questions. Senator Rarick and then Senator Matthews. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I'm looking through the bill here, I am not seeing a cap on the grants for individuals. Am I missing that, or is that not covered in the bill? Let's go to the author for that one, Senator Rarick. Senator Dibble, or Ms. Levinson-Falk. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Kelly might be able to help us. I know the Department of Commerce does set a cap. I'm not sure exactly how that mechanism works, though. Mr. Kelly, you want to come forward and offer a little commentary on the cap issue? Please. 
Mr. Kelly, welcome back to the committee. If you could identify yourself, the question is uh, reference to a cap. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I, uh, for the record, I'm John Kelly. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the department. Um, I can get you that number uh, or how we determine it. I don't have it uh, readily available. I think what Senator Rarick's asking is, is there a cap? I, uh, I will find that out. I'm not sure off the top of my head. All right. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just one other comment. I know the was brought up on an earlier bill, the amount uh, that gets used for administration. Um, you know, I see we have uh, the department is capped at 2.5%, uh, but, you know, we're looking at this saying we have $100 million that's going to go to help uh, folks with uh, their costs, but the reality is $15 million, according to what can be used, is going to go to administration. And I don't think that uh, that is what people... Um, are expecting when they I've heard from so many that uh, they're willing to help people they want to know that we're using their money wisely when we do that and when 15 percent of what we say is going to help people is actually going um, to either a government agency or a nonprofit to run their operations um, I think a lot of people struggle with that they would much rather see a greater portion of that money going to help uh, their fellow Minnesotans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Um, I don't know if you want to comment, Senator Dibble or Ms. Levinson Falk, but I thought perhaps that was addressed in the amendment, but now I guess we'll just see. Mr. Kelly, I see you back at the testifier's table. To the question, Mr. Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rarick. Um, the 15 percent uh, is uh, standard for the LIHE program. It's by the federal government. Um, the reason, and it, it, I'll agree, you know, that it is high. Um, the reason that it's high is because it's a very labor intensive process. Uh, we have to verify income. We have to reach Minnesotans and not just the department. A lot of this goes to the CAP agencies and other service providers. Um, but this is, uh, you know, reaching folks that are, maybe this is their only interaction with government. They're, you're, it's not just a simple form that's filled out. Um, the, you know, the department does a number of files, over 100,000 claims, does crisis assistance, it does all these other applications, it amounts to $66 an applicant. So I know that it sounds high, but it is, it is in line with what it's always been. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Kelly, Senator Dibble, do you want to comment on that before we go um, back to Senator Rarick? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Rarick. I had the same question. Um, you know, in reviewing the bill um, and, and was persuaded by both this, th this uh, explanation um, as well as in light of the fact that um, a focus of this particular initiative um, has two elements to it that cause administrative aspects to go up a bit, at least at the outset. One is that um, there's a real focus on outreach um, to folks who aren't currently receiving the grant um, that uh, entails uh, some you know, labor-intensive administrative overhead. Um, secondly, um, it's construed uh, now more broadly throughout the year. Again, um, uh, you know, even though it's plugging into an existing program, now it's a program that is going to reach into the summer months when people are struggling. They need to know that uh, if they're struggling and if they're, you know, suffering the consequences of, of heat and lack of air conditioning, they have somewhere to turn. Um, and so it's about making sure that folks throughout the year now, um, when, when now it's the, the program kind of goes dark, uh, for a number of months. So that is part of the as element and explanation too. So I completely agree and I hope bring that administrative overhead down. Although I will say in the Department of Transportation, their standard uh, administrative overhead is 17%. So we're doing better than I do in my own committee. So. Thanks, Senator Dibble. Um, members, we're going to keep the questions here to the bill in front of us. And I have Senator Rasmussen here who I want to try to get in today just watching the clock. I'm fine with questions just pointing out we may run a little over. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Senator Rarick, any yeah, follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick follow-up sure. on that. You know, just because the federal government puts their spending uh, caps at that level, I'm not necessarily willing to say that that's what we should just follow suit because that's what they do. Um, we have seen a number of issues, uh, I believe, where they put a lot of money out there and went uh, allowable for things and then fraud tends to happen and not saying that fraud's going to happen with this it's just that is a high 
administrative cost, in my opinion. So just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Senator Rarick, on the record, 15% is high. We're going to go to Senator Matthews. Then I have Senator Green, and then I have Senator Grunhagen. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, briefly, um, I think that, you know, not opposed to the concept of the bill. I know that we need to um, help people that need it, and uh, TRICAP was here, and they service some of my area, and I hear from many members in the community that they – uh, that they uh, do good work uh, on that. I uh, just wanted to point out, uh, Mr. Chair, my prediction is we're probably going to see a lot more bills like this over the next uh, couple of decades uh, because of just the overall cost of energy. And want to point out and encourage this committee, uh, this feels like um, government has been increasing the cost of energy through bills and programs and changes in the energy mix. And then we have to come along on the back end and have more money allocated for those who can't afford those higher energy costs, uh, break it, and then we have the fix for it. And a better suggestion would be to not break it in the first place. So I would uh, strongly urge this committee uh, to keep looking at ways of lowering the energy cost, make it more affordable, more reliable, uh, more technologies that I've been trying to get through this committee and haven't yet. Uh, as, as I keep saying, we're going to run into a math problem because the, the amount of energy leaving the state uh, is greater than the amount coming in under uh, renewable technologies, and that's just going to add to the cost. So with that, Mr. Chair, I, uh, I support this bill. I'd encourage us to uh, work on the root cause on the front end rather than just hopefully not more and more fixes on the back end. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Matthews. I'll take that bait. One of the things leaving the state is about $12 billion a year that we're sending out of state for energy that we're going to create here. We'll see in future meetings of this committee about the cost, but point, point noted. Thank you, Senator Matthews. I have Senator Green and then Senator Grunhagen. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the question is either for the author or the testifiers. There were some comments made. Uh, one of them was that uh, uh, energy costs for some of those uh, folks here have gone up twice uh, by, t by two times in uh, the last four years, I believe it was. And also the crisis is uh, uh, for uh, applying for these is up 20%. Now, uh, if I heard those right, but if not, it's, it's probably pretty close. And so even after you take out the administration, you're looking at $85 million for this program. And is this, is this to deal with uh, increased cost because of what has gone on with uh, the restrictions on on fossil fuels, or is this uh, also adding in what you're expecting to see after the passage of the clean energy blackout bill? So are you just, are you looking backwards or are you looking forwards? Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Dibble. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, much of this bill as I presented um, is to uh, deal with summertime uh, months as well when uh, folks don't have access um, to these grants. Um, uh, we know that uh, the summer months are getting much more hot and people are reliant on their air conditioning. Um, additionally, this is uh, to, to reach out to folks um, uh, who, who aren't now aware of or participating in, in receiving the LIHEAP grants. It's not to increase their grants, but it's to extend the reach to, to more families. Um, and it's over a course of, uh, of, a, of five years. If you see the appropriation is uh, available until 2029. So it's about, it'll represent about 15% of what we receive now from uh, federal LIHEAP funds over those five years. Thank you, Senator Dibble. And um, thank you for acknowledging what I mentioned to Ms. Talk, which is the outreach. We're hoping to reach more Minnesotans who are eligible for that. And that reflects part of the cost. Back to you, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the answer, but it doesn't really answer my question. I don't know if you're, if you're looking to uh, backfill a problem that has already been created, or are you looking forward? But I guess we'll... So, Mr. Chair, I there. believe I answered the question, but the short version is no. Okay. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Senator Green. Good to go to Senator Grunhagen. I think his answer is we're reaching out to more Minnesotans, not a, a relation to the energy cost increase if I understood correctly. That's thank correct. you, Senator Dibble. Ms. Levinson-Falk, just hang on. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I want to help low-income people to uh, afford uh, their heating and electricity bills, um, whatever it takes. 
I think we all support that. Uh, we want to give people a hand up or where possible. But I do want the committee, I'm just making a statement, I do want the committee to just think, you know, a couple sessions ago we passed an incentive to switch over to electric heat for uh, residential. Then we passed a bill this session that's going to, even according to the Star Tribune, is going to drive up the cost of uh, energy by billions of dollars, SF4, I believe it was. And now we're coming along and we're passing a bill to subsidize and help people afford the higher cost. You know, it, it really reminds me of what Nobel Prize winning uh, economist Milton Friedman said a number of years. He said, if you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, in five years you'll have a shortage of sand. And we seem to be promoting a fox chasing its own tail. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Grunhagen, although I believe that article you keep mentioning said the costs are billions for the transition, but the benefits are massive. So as with Senator Matthews, Senator Green, we're going to wait and see. Senator uh, Dibble, we're going to lay this bill over. Any final comments before we do that? I appreciate your allowing me the opportunity to present the bill, and I appreciate all the questions. Thank you, Mr. And Chair. And we thank both testifiers. Thank you very much. With that, Senate File 2267 is laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Rasmussen, in addition to winning the Patience Award, if you could come forward, members, this will be the last bill we hear today. Uh, this one does go to State Gov, I believe. And so we would like to get this bill heard. And with that, Senator Rasmussen, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to be in the Energy Committee today. Um, so before you is Senate File 2720, and just for some context on this bill, no, no Summit context. Carbon Solutions has proposed a carbon dioxide Details. pipeline that would be entirely within the district that I represent through Ottertail County and Wilkin County. The proposed pipeline would take CO2 produced at an ethanol plant in Fergus Falls and pipe it to North Dakota to be sequestered underground. The permit application represents a portion of one of two different carbon capture projects that have been announced to date uh, that would transport CO2 in pipelines in Minnesota and surrounding states. I want to be clear that this bill is neither a, a pro-CO2 pipeline bill nor an anti-CO2 pipeline bill. It would simply clarify that the uh, PUCs has regulatory authority to permit for CO2 pipelines by codifying it in statute. A little bit of background on this. Uh, back in December of 2021, the uh, Minnesota PUC issued a notice of comment period on potential rulemaking on CO2 pipelines. And then in May of 2022, the PUC came out and said that they have the uh, authority already to, uh, to permit and route uh, CO2 pipelines. Uh, however, as a part of that record, there is broad support and desire to modernize uh, uh, the PUC's pipeline routing rules. And as a part of that modernization work, that included adding the definition of carbon dioxide to the definition of gas in statute and expanding the definition of hazardous liquids to include those currently included in federal code. And those are the two changes that you see in the bill before you. And I just want to be clear that this bill is clarifying work that the PUC is already doing. It's not changing any of the work that the PUC is doing. Um, so the question is, you know, why the, the PUC? Um, and the reason is that they have a robust and established process uh, that is known and works when it comes to permitting and routing uh, processes for pipelines. The commission relies on public input uh, to fully understand the scope and develop the record that they use to determine uh, uh, an issue that's before them. And as a part of the uh, public comment period that's been open for this current permit, they've received input from labor groups, environmental groups, business groups, and members of the public as a part of this uh, process. And so, uh, Mr. Chair, members, happy to stand for any questions that the committee members may have. I also have uh, Christy Brusven here uh, who represents Summit Carbon Solutions. Thank you very much. Well done, Senator Rasmussen. Ms. Brisbane, welcome to the committee. If you Thank could you. first identify yourself and then present your testimony. Uh, Madam, or Mr. Chair and committee members, Christy Brisbane from Fredrickson and Byron representing Summit Carbon Solutions. I'm just here for questions. Well, now that was timely. <laughs> members, do we have any questions? Oh, really? Senator McEwen. Thank you. Just a quick question. So I, as I understand it, the PUC is already um, working on this rulemaking. So what it, could you just clarify for me, what, what's the need for the legislative piece here? Thanks. 
Thank you, Senator McEwen. Senator Rasmussen, you want to field that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator McEwen, for the questions. A great question. So the PUC would say that they have already existing authority under state law to review and issue a permit for this pipeline application. Um, I think there's just stakeholders who would like to have it very clearly stated in statute that the PUC has that authority. And so we'll be at, this bill would add carbon dioxide to the list of the definition of gas that the PUC has authority to uh, review and permit. And then it also takes um, additional, uh, or if we look at hazardous liquids, it takes what's in federal code and adds it in there. So this bill, you know, from the PUC's perspective, won't change any activities that they're actually doing today. It just would uh, clarify that in statute. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Senator McEwen, you're good. Members, again, intending to lay the bill over any for, as I clearly stated, intending to pass this and send it to state government. Any other questions? Going once, Senator Rasmussen, last comments to the bill before we vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the hearing, and um, uh, we'll continue the conversation in the next committee stop. Well done. All right, members, uh, the motion on the floor on, in committee is to recommend this pass and sent to state, local, and veterans. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? You're on your way to state government. Thank you very much, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Ms. Brusbin. Members, we are adjourned. <laughs>